thank you everyone uh, and welcome to join in joining us today for the release of this exciting new report uh, on the on the VCM. Uh, my name is Isabel Hogbrink. I'm the director of communications here at South Pole, and we are really looking forward to discussing a number of exciting issues uh, with you all today, um, as well as taking a look at some of the numbers from last year. We're also going to look at some of the most exciting developments and trends shaping the VCM in 2023 including what is supply and demand doing and what is driving it, which actors are driving integrity, both in quality of projects and also in claims, who are the ones to watch, what is the future of certain types of projects looking like, and finally, what are the impacts of COP27 agreement and where is this taking us? So um, before we get started, some quick housekeeping. You're all on mute. Please ask the questions via the question box at any time, and we will do our very best to answer them at the end of the session. And lastly, this session is being recorded. So uh, before we dive in, a uh, quick introduction of our speakers. First of all, I, we're very pleased to have Judith Legradi, who is a senior manager in our carbon portfolio team, Bamshad Hushiani, who leads our project design management and evaluation team, and last, but by no means least, Adam Sipthorpe, who is our carbon dioxide removal specialist with our portfolio team. So uh, I'm sure that many of you know a bit about South Pole, and indeed we have the pleasure of working with many of you. But in case you don't, um, South Pole is a profit for purpose company. It was founded 17 years ago in Switzerland. We work with climate solutions as well as climate projects and climate investments. This means um, on a day-to-day -day basis that we both develop and implement comprehensive climate strategies that turn action into long-term business opportunities for companies, governments and organizations around the world. So that is why many of you are here today, um, hopefully, um, to, to put in place actual climate strategies but we also are a leading project developer and we've channeled financing to nearly a thousand projects in over 15 countries over these past 17 years. Since our very beginning, South Pole's work has been complicated and challenging, uh, but we have never lost sight of why this work is so important. It is for climate impact. And what exactly is that climate impact that we're trying to achieve? Well, it's no small feat. Uh, by 2027, we ourselves will reduce one gigaton of CO2 emissions. Our portfolio will reduce another 10 gigatons of emissions by 2035. And finally, by 2050, or hopefully earlier, together with our clients, we aim to reduce 100 gigatons of CO2 emissions through the climate journey. The climate journey is this uh, sort of pathway that we work with our clients uh, to get to net zero. So why the VCM uh, and why are we here today? Well, that recent IPCC report made it abundantly clear that we need to use all the tools available in our toolbox to reach net zero emissions. The VCM does a couple of things. First of all, market mechanisms put a price on emissions. This is key. Emissions cannot be free for anyone. Two, through the VCM, um, or the VCM funnels financing to projects that protect nature and ensure a just transition to net zero, which essentially means that no one is left behind. The VCM also helps to move companies towards a more fair business model where they take responsibility for the real negative impact of emissions on humans and nature. It should be part of every company's business model that they should compensate for their emissions. And the VCM also scales up innov innovative solutions such as techn technical uh, carbon removals. And this is something that we do a lot of here at, um, at South Pole. We uh, put in place lots of interesting innovative initiatives, including technical carbon removals. So what we hope to demonstrate today is that these voluntary carbon markets are designed to continuously improve and become more for more robust, and most importantly, to scale up rapidly, to allow us to bend the curve of global emissions. Without scaling up, there is no way that we will reach net zero emissions by 2050. But as the UNEP has reminded us, the price of 
carbon credits is still not high enough. We're not making enough of an impact yet. In fact, if 1,700 of the biggest emitters around the world compensated each year for just 10% of their emissions, and these are emissions that they have not yet cut, it would mitigate nearly 30 gigatons of emissions and it would mobilize up to a trillion dollars in climate financing by 2030. We need this to happen. We need more companies to take action and we hope that today's webinar will inspire you to do so if you're not already doing it. As the IPCC has made it clear, every fraction of a degree matters. Every action counts. So without further ado, let's jump into the market spotlight. And this is over to you, Judith, our first speaker today. Thank you. Thanks, Isabel, and thank you all again for joining us. Um, we are very happy to be here with you all today. And as Isabel said, we, we are going to focus um, a lot on market developments, which are super exciting. But first, let's take a look at some of the, the key numbers. So what is happening? So on the impact side, we have seen that over the past five years, the, the voluntary carbon market has experienced a significant growth. And um, according to Trove Research, it has channeled an estimated of um, 1.3 billion USD in investment over 2022. And that means that it helped mitigate about 161 million ton of GHG emissions. Um, it's quite an abstract number. So that's kind of over three times the annual emissions of, of Switzerland. Um, if we look at the issuances, on the issuance um, which we can take as a proxy for supply and availability of carbon projects, what we can see is that more carbon credits were issued during the first six months of 2022 um, than in the full year up to 2018. And um, December um, in 2022 became um, the month with the highest volume of issuances ever recorded. It is also super important to mention here that um, 2021 proved to be an extraordinary, extraordinary year with, with an expectedly high number of requests for new projects and issuances. And um, this, this definitely hit the standards by surprise and, and created some, some kind of backup of delays in, in certification processes. If we, if we look at the demand side, we see that uh, retirements have, have been steadily growing in the past five years, um, with retirements increasing to 225, uh, 252% since 2017. And we are also seeing a significant share of new buyers entering into the market. And what we also see that there is a growing demand um, that is driven by largely by the voluntary climate targets um, as well. Now, a very quick note on prices. So similarly to, to, to other numbers that we have seen, um, last year, the average price of various technology types were, were significantly higher than, than the five-year average. Um, overall, the, price, the prices in, in 2022 are, are around 40% higher than in 2021, but uh, we've seen a bit of softening in the, in the recent, recent times. Um, this number is, is pretty impressive, but it's also framed against the backdrop of turbulent macroeconomic conditions that we we all aware of. And it's still the VCM demonstrate a market that is evolving and, and pretty resilient. So very great to see this. Um, lastly, we want to we want to also highlight two main reasons why it is pretty crucial um, for prices of carbon credits to to increase, and this was also publicized recently by, by the UNAP. Um, first of all, it's incentivizing companies to more rapidly reduce, reduce their own emissions, and secondly, it drives finance into a greater number of, um, of climate projects, which, which can become increasingly ambitious and innovative um, because there's a good rate of return. Um, if we look at the outlook, um, um, let's start by taking a look at 20, 2030. So there are a number of analysis on the market and um, analysis of the world's leading 2000 companies predicted that by 2030, the, the voluntary carbon market could potentially reduce 
and remove um, up to uh, 2.6 gigaton of GAG emission, which is approximately 30 times larger than the market in 2022. And but what are the main factors that we that we see that can influence this? So of course, like these are like three main points here, and we will um, we will focus on them later as well. But there are a number of new best practices, new initiatives. Um, there is the BCMI, SBTI, Beyond Value Chain Mitigation, and um, they all strongly urge companies to engage in Beyond Value Chain Mitigation. And one way of doing so is is through carbon credits. There are um, national policies um, coming up and these are creating new opportunities as well. And so this has the, the potential to raise ambition and, and prices in the voluntary carbon market. And equally, the market could also see more demand coming from, from the compliance, compliance sector. Um, in terms of quality, um, which is um, the, the last factor um, if impacting the size of this market, um, we we are excited to see how the market will deliver on its its promises of quality. Um, just super quickly jumping back to the short term and what's uh, what companies should know um, ahead for for the year ahead. Um, the first thing to say is that there are many exciting new issuances expected um, in 2023. Um, based on based on the pipeline data coming from Gold Standard, Barra, and South Pole's own pipeline of, of projects as well. Um, most of the near-term supply of nature-based credits will also come from Red Plus or avoided deforestation project. This is also due to the fact that halting deforestation leads to a rapid um, reduction of uh, emissions. But we have also a very strong pipeline of blue carbon and soil sequestration um, type of projects. Then um, lastly, um, there is a growing need also for, for companies to set science-based targets uh, and um, in order to, to mitigate um, emissions beyond, beyond their own value chain. However, if we look at the companies that, um, that, sci that set science-based targets, we see that only 30% of 13% of these companies are actually purchasing carbon credit. And uh, the SBTI has been also very clear about calling for companies to accelerate um, action globally alongside the decarbonizing their own value chain. And um, for this reason, they also are currently working on a beyond value chain mitigation uh, guidance, which which will be um, which will be shared in the in the coming month. And we are super excited um, about about this. Um, with this quick overview, I would love to give back um, the word and to see what are going to be our key developments. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Bamshad, over to you. Thanks, Isabel, and uh, thanks everyone, uh, all the attendees, for being here. It's a pleasure to talk about the very interesting topic of integrity, of course, um, when we talk about climate actions. Um, as said, our sector is evolving. Uh, there are still challenges to be solved and everybody I think is on board to improve this. But before going to give you an overview of what we see in integrity um, evolution in our sector, I think uh, I flash back a little bit into um, um, maybe in 70s at the Club of Rome 1972 when the report of the growth to limits was published two years after that, uh, the report of mankind at the turning point. So. Integrity topic is not something new uh, to the sustainability sector, but since those reports where we realized the conjunction between our economy, our environmental activities, and our uh, social economic workflows uh, on the ground are uh, definitely linked, and there is definitely uh, a need for action there in order to bring back equilibrium to our systems. <clears throat> well, since then, obviously, um, a lot of new initiatives around how to protect our nature, and a lot of um, natural environmental complications or problematic issues around our world. Uh, you know, most of the fragmented, let's say, uh, but well-intentioned well -intentioned work that was done, um, initiated by the UN back there uh, through different organizations and development agencies, uh, which led us eventually to result-based finance. And of course, um, IPCC, when was established 16 years after the first uh, report from Club of Rome started, um, ringing the bells to the governments, um, to the actors, that this one is going to be the most urgent topic and the most catastrophe 
that can happen to the humankind, um, which is to keep the temperature uh, increase um, up to 1.5 degrees. Um, Kyoto Protocol in 1992 eventually uh, the first and the most successful mechanism on addressing this topic by bringing a price tag to such impacts uh, started with, uh, let's say, clean development mechanism in 2005. Ever since this topic of integrity has been addressed through uh, baselines such as um, greenhouse gas emissions, and of course, uh, most of the monitoring, reporting, and verification system we have developed in the past decades to arrive to such a successful system has been addressing greenhouse gas emissions. So, so far, it um, uh, looks like we have not listened to what uh, the Club of Rome came up with, but there is a long way to go. Why? Because um, our, our market's uh, still young. Um, the intention of this market, as we discussed, was to address uh, a lack of clarity on how environmental impacts in the business models can be well uh, situated in a way to solve the current and future sustainability issues. So uh, with that uh, background and also going to the fact that uh, looking into um, uh, the, the carbon pricing discussions and how this will evolve in future, um, let's put into perspectives um, and say, um, yes, integrity uh, means a lot to our sector, but we also have to uh, define uh, uh, what are the extent of these um, uh, integrities that we are going to address with the current uh, carbon finance and the, with the current price in our systems. And to that extent, uh, in terms of project boundaries, uh, when we enter into project boundary, is the baseline on, only lo uh, to look into uh, how much emissions in the baseline was being emitted, or, or face the reality that we are actually into, uh, entering into a space where there is a lot of other bottlenecks, uh, a lot of challenges on the ground related to um, uh, decades of um, perhaps neglection of our um, environmental and human uh, resources, um, uh, capacity on the ground, governance, uh, policies, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this integrity topic, in my view, and of course, I, I understand most of the colleagues think this way is, is complex, but I think uh, we are at the stage uh, with the experience so far we gained in the uh, climate action and the climate sector, uh, we do have instruments to um, uh, firmly, gradually, but steadily um, address this in the best way possible. Um, having that in mind, standards and methodologies, um, as I mentioned to you, UNFCCC came up uh, with the very first mechanisms uh, that was based um, from IPCC, um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who came up with protocols to identify and quantify these greenhouse gas emissions, um, came up with um, specific methodologies to, um, uh, to count or count on emission reductions that are occurring into the pro in, in the project boundaries. Uh, these up to today's um, uh, 50 years almost after Club of Rome, um, our um, majority of them mostly are focused obviously on how greenhouse gas emissions um, in the baseline and project scenarios are being addressed. Uh, coming to this topic, specific MRV topic, uh, of course, uh, we are aware that um, MRV is uh, being improved on so many different scopes and methodologies. Digital MRV is a topic that is coming into space already uh, within some scopes. This is happening. Um, but let's also, while uh, admiring the advantages of MRV, uh, uh, let's face the facts that so far in our sectors, uh, MRV uh, was a topic for emission reductions. And I think we all agree uh, there is more than that to be addressed on the ground uh, when it comes to uh, topics such as governance, uh, such as communities, uh, such as financial distribution and performance of projects and so on. Uh, we need to add a lot of capacity and a lot of monitoring um, systems um, and reporting on them. Um, going to what SAPL now foresees or is designing to um, address a lot of topics that let's say is not necessarily addressed as an integrity topic directly to through uh, MRV reports or, or the existing mechanisms. Of course, you are aware that um, a lot of um, NGO non-profit activities on the integrity of our uh, market and carbon credits are also uh, alive and going on. ICVCM is still uh, this week uh, launching um, these instructions, uh, which is uh, to be seen as uh, some of the improvements. But at SAPO, we look into organizing, um, let's say what we call a quality assurance uh, framework or mechanism, not to address, um, let's say, quality on a strategic level when we start searching for projects or initiating projects 
but also uh, when the projects become operational, how in the long run, on a frequent base, uh, we're going to have a traceability, transparency, and um, a very clear line of reporting uh, on emission reductions, but also on other criteria that our sector is discussing these days. Um, having that said, of course, um, uh, nature-based solutions uh, come to mind, um, uh, which is the next topic we are discussing on how uh, greatly can be an example on uh, the sets of new criteria that could be designed to protect um, um, our, our sector, but also to add more uh, transparency on our impacts long term. Biodiversity is, of course, um, and in general, uh, socio ecological aspects of um, uh, nature based solutions are, are, are the most important factors when it comes to uh, linking this triangle of um, our economy. Our, our social um, aspects on the ground plus uh, nature recovery or conservation. And I think uh, most of us agree that um, one of the most challenging and complex, let's say, models or scopes we are dealing with today is where we have all these uh, very complex um, uh, flux where um, humankind is interfering with uh, nature and our economy is also, on the other hand, um, having linking um, with the resource use on the ground. So uh, by that have in mind, we know that, um, uh, for instance, when you look into integrity of the sector, um, uh, uh, initiatives such as uh, Plan Vivo is now being accredited, um, uh, uh, CCBS was already there. So there are more and more new initiatives to cover um, valuable um, um, criteria that link society and nature, um, but also um, looking into how, for instance, in the Red Plus, uh, the recent methodological evolvements are trying to uh, reform into uh, best practices on becoming perhaps um, more certain or more conservative when it comes to revalidation of our baselines. Um, so these topics, I think, are linking, um, uh, let's say, uh, overall integrity topic. We see for a sustainability sector, but focusing on our sector, I think we need to have a, a very good eye on how nature-based solution and the integrity topic in this uh, specific scope will evolve. Um, thank you very much. I think um, yes. I think that uh, really then we're over to Judith, right? Yes. Thank you. Um, so, so the other side of 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 the coin of developing high integrity um, carbon projects is using them in a credible way, and um, carbon credit still remains one of the most viable near-term option for companies to have uh, to, to measurably reduce their um, global emissions. Um, but they role in in corporate climate plans and, and targets needs to be needs to be clear in order to in order to avoid greenwashing and, and truly addressing the um, the irreversible impacts of, of, of climate change. Um, carbon credits should be also used and talk about um, by companies according to clear set of principles that simplify and amplify the right things. We, we also have a, a guidance on the usage of um, carbon credit principles um, and so it should be grounded in science and it should be building on, on the work of credible initiatives. Um, previously I mentioned SBTI and VCMI, but there are also many other other great initiatives that are are coming up as well. Um, the VCMI uh, at the moment they are updating their claims code of practice, uh, which is a guidance that is is expected to be published in the coming month, and they they offer companies clarity on on, on demand side related doubts and claims. Um, and we see this as part of an overall collective effort to build clarity and also somewhat of a standardization around, around the language that we use um, when we talk about corporate um, climate targets and, and the progress um, that are made. Um, what we see as a, as a big uh, movement in the market is, in, in general, the market is overall moving away from, from from catch-all claims like climate neutrality and to focusing more on, on, on the global journey to, to net zero. Uh, we see that 
countries like France is pretty ahead of ahead of the curve. France has been uh, one of the most advanced also in terms of regulation, um, regulating climate neutrality claims and, and setting clear guidance on, on how companies can uh, can transparently communicate about this. However, there are also other countries um, in, in the European Union and also globally where we see um, principles or guidances coming up. Um, you might have seen also recently the, the recent Green Claims Directive from, from the EU Commission as well. So what we see at the moment is that with, with the more complex landscape of, of national target, climate targets and international standards, um, this, this global debate is, is becoming increasingly uh, complex and it's also increasingly highlighting the, the role of, of private sector in financing global, um, global climate protection. Um, and in order to support companies to talk about their climate action in a transparent and honest way, um, we developed a new uh, fund, funding climate action label. And this label is also built on transparency and it, it aims to demonstrate that companies are taking responsibility for, for its own or, or for their the products emission as in, and in the same time having a very clear plan to reduce um, these emissions over the, over the time. Um, this label is also designed for companies who want um, a credible way of communicating um, the climate action that they have um, to their audience. So, if you're interested to know more about this as well, we, we highly recommend to reach out to us. We are, we are more than happy happy to, to share more. Um, with this, I would like to hand over to Adam to, to speak about CDRs. Thanks, Judith. And good to be here today um, to talk to you all about tech removals. So just as a quick overview on tech removals, um, they're defined as those projects that use some kind of an engineered approach um, to remove carbon either directly from the atmosphere or you know using plants so via the biosphere in order to store them permanently and the storage can be in two different ways really you can either have durable products as a storage so things like storing it in cements and asphalts or even biochar or in dedicated long-term geological sequestration so putting it into depleted oil and gas wells or saline aquifers um, and most of these solutions permanently remove the carbon from the atmosphere for over a thousand years. Um, over the past year, we've seen some major attention put on tech removals, um, especially in the form of commitments, so both on kind of monetary value based commitments, but also on volume commitments um, given to either as a collective um, tech removals or as individuals as well. Um, what is important to note, however, is that although removals are vitally important, um, there are no, there is no silver bullet in this market. You know, we need companies globally to decarbonize and globally to support projects that avoid carbon in a large scale, especially in the short to medium term. Also supporting carbon removal techniques to make sure that they can scale um, fast enough um, in the in the short term to be able to be at scale in the long term when we really need them. Um, and I think the IPCC report that was released last week really shows this well. Um, it is likely that we may overshoot the 1.5 degrees target um, in the short term now, um, and therefore we are going to need removals on a huge scale in order to bring temperatures back down to a relatively safe level. Um, all removal types will be needed for this, and quite frankly, we don't really have the luxury of time anymore to pick and choose which ones that we, we focus on here. We must scale both nature-based solutions and technical removals in parallel. Um, in the tech removal field, South Pole is working across the entire value chain in order to bring tech removals to market maturity. Um, firstly, we're developing robust methodologies under the CCS Plus initiative for things like direct air capture and bioenergy with carbon removal and sequestration. And this is alongside Vera. Um, and we also co-developed the recent BCS biochar methodology that was released last year. Um, having ICRO endorsed methodologies in the market does give companies that confidence that they are purchasing a high quality removal as well. Um, and secondly, we, we're aggregating demand with what, what we call our next gen CDR facility. Um, and this has the ambition to procure over a million tons of technical carbon removals that will be delivered before 2030. And really the hypothesis and the reason for setting it up in this way is we're giving 
carbon removal companies a guaranteed revenue stream to begin construction and operations. Um, and then finally, in the work more kind of wider client base of South Pole, we are beginning to include carbon removals and encouraging clients to include carbon removals as part of their portfolio. So we recognize that these credits are a bit more expensive than the market average credit right now, but small investments today can really help this industry to grow in the long term by creating something um, very important in the, in the form of demand signals that allows companies to, to have the confidence to launch and to start operation. Um, maybe one area that I'd, I'd like to just spend a couple minutes on here as well um, in more detail is around biochar. So this is a tech removal solution that has huge potential in the short term to deliver some very highly permanent credits, um, especially whilst we're waiting for some of the other tech removal types like direct air capture um, to reach the scale that, that we need them to. So biochar is a highly porous, almost well charcoal-like substance formed through heating waste biomass um, without oxygen. And by doing this, you're locking in the carbon dioxide that's in that biomass in a very stable form where it shouldn't decompose. Um, and alongside the pure carbon removal benefits, it also acts as a soil amendment. Also through the, the syngas is reduced, you can either have an energy source of heat or electricity. And then the physical biochar itself can mitigate the impacts of droughts and floods. Um, and maybe just a few closing thoughts from my side. Longer term, solutions we know you know generally they come with a higher price tag today because of the cost of innovation and the cost of scaling needs to be covered in order to be able to continue to scale them up um south Pole is here to try and help you find a sweet spot for for your investments into this space and recommends taking a more portfolio approach so investing in a wide range of promising solutions alongside a wider portfolio as well in order to to minimize the risk um you know this is still a very early stage market with huge potential and a huge media spot right now right now um, and this allows us to encourage the much needed innovation that we need in this space but also um, you know keeping a level playing field and not picking winners or losers in this space um, at a too early stage um, and on those thoughts I'd like to pass it back over to Judah um, who will talk to you a bit more about regulation and policy. Thank you so much Adam so moving to a, a, a bit different segment so um, a lot of the policy and regulatory trends that we that we see um, these days um, go back to the Paris Agreement. So under under the Paris Agreement, countries set um, climate targets, uh, so-called um, nationally determined contributions, and we see that there is more pressure um, ramping up to start making pro progress towards towards the NDCs. And for this reason, countries are exploring ways to, to, to leverage on, on carbon markets in order to help them achieving their um, the climate targets. We see that um, developed nations are facing a significant challenge in meeting their climate targets um, due to the high costs um, involved. On the, on the other hand, um, less economically developed countries are struggling to finance their they targets. So overall, what we see is that Article 6 of the Paris Agreement introduced the possibility for countries, but also for, for private, um, private actors to, to finance activities in countries by, um, by providing a more cost-effective means to, to achieve national um, NDC targets in, in buyer countries and um, by a channel for, for additional finance for, for climate action in, in, in seller countries. So this, this created this new international compliance market um, under Article 6. The most um, important difference between this new market um, mechanism under Article 6 and the voluntary carbon market is a corresponding adjustment. Um, you might have heard about it already. It's um, so basically if, if there is a verified emission reduction that is transacted under Article 6, um, the, seller, the seller country needs to take um, the emission reduction out of its um, GAG inventory so the buyer country can correspondingly adjust and bring the emission reduction into its GAG inventory. Um, as you can imagine, this means that this kind of 
um, transactions or Article 6 transactions require quite a bit of government processes and authorizations, and we are we are still still in progress um, with that. Um, in brief, um, Article 6 allows countries to, to use emission reductions um, that, that achieve through cooperation with other, other countries um, in order to meet their the own emission um, targets. Uh, ultimately, Article 6 is, is designed to, to enable sectors and countries to, to reach net zero emissions. Um, just a few examples. So countries like South Korea, Japan, and Singapore are are leading from from the buyer side, while Ghana, um, Colombia, and Thailand are ahead of the curve on on the supply side. However, what we see is that the approach from countries remains still um, fragmented and varies um, somewhat. Um, in Thailand, South Pole is, is helping to deliver one of the world's first um, Article 6 transaction between the government of Thailand and the government of Switzerland um, with the, the Bangkok eBus program. And um, in this case, the, the Swiss and the Thai government authorized this first Article 6 program in, in um, Asia last month, um, which, is, uh, which is a super exciting milestone for, for South Pole. And also, um, this project uh, helps to decarbonize, uh, decarbonize the, the Thai mobility sector and also have uh, lots of really nice uh, qualities like improving air quality as well and improving well-being. Um, and lastly, um, you, you probably heard a lot about Article 6 and corresponding adjustment and you're also wondering um, how this, what's the relation with, with, with voluntary carbon market. Um, the, the main message here is to remember that Paris Agreement does not govern the voluntary carbon market. And for, for this reason, it does not require um, corresponding adjustment for voluntary, voluntary action. Also, um, the last COP27 also signed off the use of carbon credit um, without corresponding adjustment for, for voluntary actions. Um, and this is by, by way of a result-based um, result finance or a mitigation contribution towards a reduction of emission in, in the host country, which is, which is another, another encouragement for, for, for voluntary, voluntary action. Um, with this, I would love to hand it back to Isabel as well. Thank you so much, Judith. I hope you can see me. Here we go. Um, so basically, um, I think that um, we go before we go to questions and uh, uh, and the main takeaways. If you'd like to dig into the trends and read more about this, then please download our BCM report. Uh, someone will be adding the link in the questions here. Um, and um, I think that you will find when you read through the report that there are perhaps three key takeaways. Uh, one, of course, that the VCM is scaling climate finance and it's acting in a space that governments, unfortunately, um, you know, are yet to properly, pro properly serve, right? So we, while governments are doing a lot, some more than others, uh, there is a vacuum in climate action and that needs to be filled by the private sector on a voluntary basis. So the VCM is the tool for that. Secondly, it's really one of the only climate finance instruments of any significant scale that we have today. So while it might not be perfect, um, ambitious co companies know that both the latest APCC report and the Science-Based Targets Initiative have made it very clear that beyond value change, uh, chain mitigation, which is essentially carbon credits, carbon offsetting, and the VCM are essential to channel financing to climate protection. We need to use the VCM. And it also, at the same time, needs to become more robust. It is not perfect. It needs to be more robust in order for it to scale. Uh, and this, in turn, will allow us to bend the curve of global emissions, which is urgent. Um, we hope that we have demonstrated this in this webinar. Integrity, of course, is at the heart of this. We need to ensure that the market works as effectively and as efficiently as possible by incorporating continuous advancements in technology, in methodology improvements, in science. All of that good stuff needs to continuously help to improve the VCM. 
uh, and that all the carbon credits that are issues uh, are done so with integrity. But let's remember that the voluntary carbon market is still in its adolescence. It's still a teenager. We cannot demand uh, that it works perfectly. It is not a perfect market, but it is the best that we have right now. There are going to be hurdles. There are going to be debates. Some of them are in the media. As you know, recently there's been a lot of debate involving South Pole in the media and sometimes in private. But constant improvements uh, are necessary before it reaches maturity, and that's okay. We just need the VCM to improve, but at the same time, we need to use it to reduce emissions. We need to all work together to ensure that the voluntary carbon market operates as effectively as possible. And so now um, we're going to go to your questions, um, and I will see here what those questions are. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, let me see, I am going to see here. Maybe I can ask one of our speakers, uh, what are the most exciting new project types coming uh, and to be available soon? That seems to be a question that is being sent here. I don't know, uh, Adam, you, you're in the technological removal space. <laughs> There's some exciting project there, I bet. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, maybe I'm a bit biased because I, I look at this day in and day out. Um, but yeah, there's a wide range of large scale tech removal solutions that will be online in the next two to three years. Um, so if we go from today, I think the most exciting area in, in my field is around biochar and really the scale that we can have in biochar across the globe as well. Um, but then in the next couple of years, we're going to start to see hundreds of thousands of tons and also megaton scale direct air capture facilities come online um, as well as there's a lot of projects focused right now in the US but I think that as other governments across the world are starting to um, offer incentives as well and policy support around this we're going to see this evolve across Europe and more widely across the globe in, in the long term as well. All right, wonderful. I didn't hear all of that, but I hope other people did. Um, Bamshad, will you nod if you heard all of Adam's response? Okay, then it was just my Wi-Fi. All right, we have another question, uh, and that is, can you please elaborate more on the climate action label? How it is funded? Is there anyone here who can? Uh, we we do we have an answer there. There's a link, but is there anyone else who wants to talk about the climate action label? So, um, hi, I can take, take this cam, um, question. So, so basically through, through the label, um, com companies can, can show that taking responsibility and, and action for, for their climate impact. And there is a clear plan to, to reduce um, the emissions over time. Uh, we we strongly encourage companies to to measure their emissions and also to to set targets and 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 to take responsibility for for their residual emissions by by compensating with high quality um, carbon um, carbon credits and and have a clear clear communication. If you if you want to um, if, if you want to understand better how you can apply for our label, just um, get in touch with us, and we can understand better, like how, how, um, how is where are you at your climate journey, and how we can apply our label requirements. Great, thank you. Um, and then it says here's another question: uh, Due to the increasing costs in the VCM, would you recommend that companies forward buy for future years? Do that an add-on, perhaps. I, I can start, but uh, Adam, feel free to jump in. So we we cannot predict future prices. Unfortunately, we don't we don't have the crystal ball um, either at South Pole. However, um, there are a lot of research uh, in this topic, and there are a lot of predictions that that says that prices will significantly increase in the in the coming years. And uh, as we said before as well, there's there's a need to increase. Um, the, the prices and the, and in the same time 
what we say, what we always suggest is that um, companies should have a, a carbon um, carbon credit purchasing strategy, um, where where we where which should be linked also to the the climate strategies, and um, this is where we can also help, and and we we can definitely help to start with uh, with these procurement strategies from early on, and uh, in order to 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 lock prices for the future. Adam, did and, you want to jump in? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, maybe I can add as well. Um, it's sometimes good to remember that the voluntary carbon market acts as this incubation hub as well for, for innovation. Um, and of course, with strict guidelines in the methodology to ensure high integrity and high quality, um, a lot of these technologies that we look into may be first of a kind deployments or deployments um, coming soon into the innovation cycles. Um, and I think there it is vitally important that we have future um, future agreements as well and forward deals, um, because these are projects where if they try and go out and get conventional funding and conventional investment, it's harder. So if they can have these forward agreements in place and they can scale at a faster rate, and then over time this leads to a bit of a snowball effect where um, we can have more deployments of these technologies and really get to scale quicker. Great. While I have you on the line here, Adam, uh, next question is for you. Does Southpol have a grading mechanism for various CDR techs that can have higher, that may have higher co confidence MRV, especially when industry is questioning NBS so heavily today? A uh, yes, mechanism. yes, of course. And I think Bamsha can give some answers here as well from the more standards and methodology side. Um, what I would say is, of course, we have kind of layers of grading mechanisms within South Pole. So of course, from the first stance, we look at the standards and the methodologies and we look at the high quality standards, particularly under the ICROA label. Um, and then from there, depending on the project type, we, we will have an honest conversation with the clients as well on what are the benefits of having one project versus another. Um, of course, you know, maybe there's more co-benefits with one project type uh, versus more long-term scale benefits with another project type. Um, so really having one grade for CDRs is quite a hard thing to put in place, right? Um, so we will tell you the cons and, um, pros and cons from different project types there. Um, and then finally, we have, of course, our own quality assurance and our own due diligence that we do on every project that we, that we have in our portfolio. Um, and we can give you any of the details on those projects um, in our conversations. Um, but Bamshel, I don't know if you have anything to add from your side. Thanks, Adam. Uh, yes, um, maybe uh, something to add in terms of, uh, in general, the integrity of MRV, um, regardless uh, of scope, I would say, um, definitely uh, ever since uh, the first methodology started with the MRV systems for, for climate action, uh, we have been improving um, in a quantitative manner how we measure emission reduction. Uh, but again, um, and as, as we said, this leading to digital MRV, adding more uh, data quality, uh, less human error, transparency, traceability, as you have it there. But again, um, a, a, a majority part of what we act on the ground uh, with different, many different varieties of players, from public to private, to NGOs, to communities, um, and different players, uh, these cannot necessarily be um, monitored under the existing uh, carbon MRV um, methodologies. Of course, as, as, as mentioned, standards have been active specifically in the past few years to improve uh, the integrity by adding more layers of, of this uh, uh, in order to improve uh, the general integrity. Um, but SAPO uh, and partners are, as I mentioned, uh, looking into this. So besides the quantitative ma matters in our sector, besides the uh, emission reduction MRV, what other types of monitoring uh, or evaluation mechanisms we need to have in place. I think this is the, the growing and evolving matter that SAPO is also uh, hopefully leading with other partners and uh, we can hear more about this uh, in the near future. Thank you so much, Bamshad. Um, we have another question here and I think this one is for Judith. Uh, can governments use credits from BCM projects as part of their NDC reporting? Um, so it's it's important to emphasize that um, Article Six of Paris Agreement doesn't govern the the voluntary carbon market, and um, and also um, the the last COP basically um, 
said with the, that, that credits under 6.4 can be bought without corresponding adjustment and it can be used as mitigation contribution. And so this, is, this also means that um, verified contribution to climate action um, can be contributing to host country. So it's, it's, it's also the same logic that what our, our new label, new, new label is, um, is using. Okay, excellent. All right, so you really need to separate government action and NDCs from voluntary action, right? Exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we have uh, we have not time for a couple more questions. If anyone wants to add them, here's one. What role do carbon credits play on the path to net zero? I think we've gone through that in the webinar, but do that. Do you want to just go through that one more time? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so the best thing a company can do is is definitely start measuring um, their footprint and reducing their footprint. But of course, we um, we need reduction over the time, and uh, we don't really have a a lot of time. Um, and in the interim uh, period, companies can buy carbon credits, and this is a this is an essential way. Um, to contribute to the global GAG reductions. And um, as BTI net zero standard also says that um, the emissions companies need to, to reduce uh, the emissions 80, 90%. And in the same time, they need to engage with B, within um, beyond value chain mitigation, um, given, given the urgency. And once they reduce their emissions, they should um, still focus on um neutralizing uh, and permanently removing with um, some of the new upcoming technologies that adam also mentioned mm. so it is really really key um to use offsets as part of your uh, as part of your net zero strategy um uh, bamshad back to you can i ask you what are some exciting areas that you're working into increasingly and and might I add a hint, uh, could you talk about blue carbon, maybe, as part of that? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Isabel. I think it's a very relevant point talking about blue carbon. Uh, not only this sector uh, is a little bit uh, underrepresented um, in the past, uh, also when we look into NDS uh, as a whole, um, but uh, looking into some of these scenarios, we are dealing with um, uh, the climate change. Uh, in some of these scenarios, we, as most of you know, we do have a severe uh, rise of sea levels. So uh, looking into uh, marine ecosystems, uh, looking into resilience and adaptation in such areas, and microeconomies, fisheries, um, other types of, let's say, mangrove ecosystems, and so on. Um, it is very important to, uh, to again, um, pay more attention to this topic. Again, uh, going back to the triangular equilibrium I mentioned, this is where exactly economy and societies and environmental really come together. And, and this is one of the best examples how we can show equality work and definitely will be a, a, a very exciting um, sphere to watch. So when do we, when should we keep our eyes peeled? Is there, are there any interesting uh, announcements anytime soon? No, no previews. Well, well, the team is very busy on, on such topics, definitely. In the coming year, we'll have uh, more exciting uh, topics, how we'd like to work with our partners to scale up uh, such quality type of ecosystems uh, when we talk about uh, wetland restoration and, and recovery topics, yes. Okay, wonderful. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, it's been a very, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I certainly have learned a lot. I hope everyone has as well. And um, thank you so much for everyone, all the speakers. Thank you for all the participants. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, again, if you are interested in reading the report, I think it has the link has been put there. Otherwise, you can easily find it on our website. And we certainly hope to see you uh, soon again.